nurses, the pharmacists, and social. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage lender. Spring will be here soon, so if buying a new home is on your to-do list, right now is the time to call Quicken Loans. Learn about which mortgage options make sense for you and get a jump on your competition. With our exclusive Rate Shield approval, the low rate you lock today is protected for up to 90 days while you shop for your new home. With a Rate Shield approval, if rates go up, your low rate stays locked. But if rates go down, you get that new, even lower rate. Either way, you win. Talk to us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com to take advantage. Here's another great reason to work with us. For a record nine years in a row, J.D. Power has ranked Quicken Loans highest in the nation in customer satisfaction for primary mortgage origination. Again, to lock in today's low mortgage interest rate and get the security of our exclusive rate shield approval, call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. For J.D. Power award information, visit jdpower.com. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Hi, welcome to this Subway ad for the new Sesame Ginger Glaze Chicken Signature Wrap. How would you like it? I'll take a... Sports announcer at home? Yeah, how'd you... We just know. My wife picks up the new Signature Wrap. It's got double the rotisserie style chicken mixed with a Sesame Ginger Glaze. She appears annoyed at me, but she shrugs it off. Those sweet and savory flavors are calling her name. She lifts the wrap and... She takes the bite! Incredible! And now she's closing the door on my... Subway, make it what you want. Limited time only at participating restaurants. Double meat based on average six-inch sub. I'm little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, Dad, like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pour me out. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. It's the refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I'm Alan Ray, and I do this for free. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Something happened, which unleashed the power of our imagination. We were to the talk. I want to talk to you. I feel like I'm drowning. Happy Friday, everybody. It is the refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I am your humble host, Alan Ray, doing this for free. Yes, it is another edition of I Do This For Free on a political free Friday night. You just heard in the crease with Jeff. Oh my gosh, what a great one. I love 
everything that has to do with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, yada, yada, yada. I grew up on that stuff. What a great show. Just really killing it lately. I got a pretty good one going on tonight, too. A lot of things to talk about. Weird Wars, the planet that is changing right under your feet right now. And penguins. Don't go anywhere. This is going to get fun. No, that wasn't me snorting cocaine off the belly of an Asian hooker. I was just trying to catch my breath. Michigan has gotten muggy. It's gotten nasty. And uh, I'll tell you what. I'm looking forward to it. I'm tired of cold. I want warm. I want to sweat. I want to get out there and have some fun. You know, I went down a rabbit hole this week, okay? I'm, I'm not even going to kid you. And this is all 100% my daughter's fault. Not even going to try to tell you it's anybody else's. <laughs> was she Mexican? JC in chat says it was a Mexican, not an Asian. My bad. Sometimes it's hard to tell from where I was. Anyway, my daughter sent me a text and she said, I have to look into this. And I did. And I fell down a rabbit hole. And so as a result, you are going to go down the rabbit hole with me, my dearly beloved listeners. And what I'm talking about, it's been one of those weeks, okay? Let, let me back up a little bit. I have, for the last two weeks, been working the shift that I worked for like, I don't know, 32 years. From 8 in the morning till 4.30 at night. I used to work from like 7.15 in the morning till 7 at night. But three years ago, I re-careered, got a new position, and I started working from like 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 11.30 at night. And I got really used to not waking up to an alarm clock. Now, now, because of this virus, of which I will not say the word because I'm tired of it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a one-man show. My two coworkers took a furlough, and I'm working from 8 to 4.30. I forgot what it was like to celebrate a Friday night, but yet here I am celebrating a Friday night with you. And um, if you're in the chat, welcome to the people in the chat. We got Jeff, we got Ron, we got Ordy, we got Shelly, uh, we got Kat. I mean, we got all these great people sitting in the chat. We got Mike, uh, JC, Eric, all of them. And just, you love these people. They're so great. Uh, if you're not in the chat, you're listening to this live, get in there, www.klrnradio.net. And you'll see the link that says, listen live, hit it, and it'll go right to chat and talk to us. Let me know you're out there. So anyways, I digress. I'm going to get on with this because those of you who are not listening to this live are probably thinking, what is he talking about? This is what I'm talking about. Um, we mark time. We mark our history by wars. You go throughout history from the very beginning all the way up through, I mean, now. And you can mark time by wars. Roman wars, um, Syrian wars. You get into you know, the United States of America. We started out with the revolution. We had the War of 1812. We go to the Civil War. We go to World War I, World War II, uh, Korean War, Vietnam. And there's little wars dotted in between all of that. But do you know there's a lot of wars that history seems to have just, uh, I don't know, like a cat in a cat box kind of just buried over. And that's what I want to talk about today, at least for the first half of the show. There are wars out there that are just absolutely bizarre. And I want to talk about a few of them. I want to talk about the top 10 most bizarre wars that you've never heard of. Starting out. In 1883, 
The citizens of Lajar, a small village in southern Spain, were infuriated when they heard reports that while visiting Paris, the Spanish king Alfonso VII, oh, Alfonso XII, I take that back. My Roman uh, numerals have gone downhill since I graduated from high school, what, 35 years ago, uh, had been insulted and even attacked in the streets of Parisian mobs. In response, the mayor of Lajar, Don Miguel Garcia Siez, and all 300 citizens of Lajar declared war on France on October 14, 1883. Not a single shot was fired, and not a single casualty sustained on either side during the confrontation. But despite the anticlimactic war, Mayor Siez declared the terror, uh, he de- was declared the terror of the Sierras for his exploit. A full 93 years later, in 1976, when yours truly was but a lad, 11 years old. Yes, I'm old. King Juan Carlos of Spain made a trip to Paris during which he treated, was treated with great respect by the citizens of the French capital. In 1981, the town council of Lijar ruled that in view of the excellent attitude of the French, they would end the hostilities and agree to a ceasefire with France, which there was no firing. So a 98-year war. Casualties? None. Oh. Once again. Uh, Another war began in uh, 1325 when a rivalry between the independent cities of uh, city states, I should say, of Madonna and Bologna spiraled out of control over the most unlikely things, a wooden bucket. Apparently, the trouble started when a band of Modena soldiers raided Bologna and stole a large wooden bucket. The raid was successful, but Bologna, wishing to secure both its bucket and its pride, declared war on Modena. I guess it's Modena. Yes, that's what I should say. The war raged down for 12 whole years, but Bologna never did manage to get its bucket back. To this day, the bucket's still stored in Modena's bell tower. 12-year war, casualties unknown. Now, we go into the most stupid war you're ever going to hear about. (laughs) You know you've got bad leadership when something like this happens. The president of Paraguay, Francisco Solano Lopez, was a huge admirer admirer of Napoleon Bonaparte. He fancied himself a skilled tactician and an excellent commander, but lacked one thing. He'd never been in a war. So to solve this problem, in 1864, he declared war on Paraguay's three surrounding neighbors all at once. Argentina, Brazil, in Uruguay. Now, if you know, if you're a fan of like scrolling through uh, Google Earth, You look at Paraguay, and then you look at Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. There's a big difference in the landmass of those three countries. (sighs) Well, the outcome of the war, well, Paraguay was very nearly annihilated. It estimated that 90% of its male population died during that war of disease, starvation, and battles with the enemy armies. This was perhaps the most needless and stupid wars in the history since Lopez had almost no reason to declare war on any of his more powerful neighbors. He just declared it because he wanted to be known as a great tactician. A six-year war. Casualties on both sides was 400,000 people. How stupid is that? Uh, Carrying on. 1925, Greece and Bulgaria were not friends. They had fought each other during the First World War, and those wounds had not yet healed. Tensions were perpetually high along the border, especially along an area called Petrik. Those tensions reached a boiling point on October 22, 1925, when a Greek soldier chased his dog across the Bulgarian border and was shot dead by Bulgarian sentry. Greece vowed retaliation and, true to its word, It invaded Petrik the very next day. They quickly cleared Bulgarian forces from the area, but were halted by the League of Nations, who sanctioned Greece and ordered them to leave Petrik and pay Bulgaria for damages. Greece withdrew its forces 10 days later and paid Bulgaria 45,000 pounds. The war duration? 10 days. Casualties? 52 dead on both sides. These are wars that you just don't hear about in history. Next one up, the Aroostook War was a military confrontation between the United States and Great Britain over the border of Maine. Talk about senseless. I I take that back. I love Maine. My wife and I used to vacation in Maine all the time. 
I, I would move there except for the winter times. No. Anyways, after the War of 1812, British forces had occupied most of eastern Maine, and despite having no troops in the area, still regarded it as British territory. In the winter of 1838, American woodcutters cut firewood in the disputed area, and as a result, incited the ire of Great Britain, who moved troops into the area. American troops moved over as well, and it looked like a war was imminent. However... Logistics on each side got snarled, and the Americans received enormous amounts of pork and beans due to a mistake in the supply department. This led to the war's most popular nickname, the War of Pork and Beans. For nearly a year, British and American troops waited each other out before their respective governments finally reached an, an agreement. Britain agreed to give America back to eastern Maine, and in return, American troops backed down. The Aerostook War was devoid of military combat, but... There were still hundreds of deaths from diseases and accidental injuries. So you don't really have to fire a shot to have deaths in a war. This war, 11 months. Casualties, 550 dead, both sides. Another bizarre war on American soil. The British-American War, the Pig War, was started when a British infantryman shot a pig that was wandering on American soil. The local American militia responded by gathering at the border and waiting for the British to make a move. Eventually, the British apologized, and the brief war ended, leaving the pig as the only casualty. So a four-month war, well, and you had one pig as a casualty. Pretty bizarre. Uh, another war fought between the Netherlands and the Isle of Sicily. Oh, uh, Isle of Scilly? 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 How do you say that? I don't know. Which is located off the southwest coast of Great Britain. The war started <clears throat> in 1651, but like many wars of that era, it was not taken seriously and soon forgot about it. Three centuries passed. Before the two countries finally agreed to a peace treaty in 1986, making their war the longest in human history. What is wrong with these people? You declare war on each other and then you wander off and forget about it. Were they stoned? This sounds like something a bunch of stone people would do. War duration, 350, uh, 335 years and no casualties. Pretty bizarre. Moving on. Some wars begin with a surprise attack, others a massacre, but this one began with a football game. And by football, I'm talking European football, you know, the, the kind with the round ball, not the oblong ball. It's not really football, it's soccer. But we know that. Um, a football game between El Salvador and Honduras in 1969. El Salvador lost the game and tensions rose and rose until on June 14th, the El Salvadorian army launched an attack on Honduras. Surprised by the sudden violence of the organization of American states organized a ceasefire that was put into effect on June 20th, just 100 hours after the first shots were fired. So you have a four-day war, 3,000 dead on both sides. I think we were better off with the pig. Yeah, that's right. That's not football. Uh <laughs> Another war began shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union when the former Soviet bloc country of Moldova experienced a crisis. Two-thirds of the country wanted closer ties with Romania, but the remaining third wanted to remain close with Russia. As a result, war erupted. But what makes this war truly strange is that the men fighting each other during the day often gathered in no man's land at night to mingle and drink. Soldiers even made packs not to shoot each other if they saw each other during the battle the next day. And this wasn't the well, one-time thing. It happened nearly every night for the duration of the war. One soldier actually wrote in his journal, the war is like a grotesque party. During the day, we kill our enemy. During the night, we drink with them. What a bizarre thing war is. That was a four-month war, 1,300 people dead on both sides, and a lot of alcohol drank. Finally, the, the tenth, the best thing I've come across, and what led me down this rabbit hole to begin with, is the War of the Emus. The Great Emu Conflict of 1932 was a war fought in Australia. Back in 1932, emus were causing chaos in Western Australia. In the district of Campion, emus are indigenous to Australia and they're very large birds. Of course, they're flightless. We know that. Um, the massive number of emus in the area was causing a concern to the locals. Now, 
Emus migrate from the coastal region to inland regions each year for breeding. An estimated 20,000 emus realize that uh, the farmland that was newly cultivated there uh, was a good place for them to breed and to find food. The farmers were obviously not happy because their wheat crops that they had just planted were being destroyed. The emus also damaged fences, which allowed rabbits to get through and to destroy the crops. Farming was already difficult before the emus appeared in the area. So the Australian government um, wasn't really providing the farmers with the subsidies, which they had been promised at the time, and the wheat prices were falling. So a group of ex-soldiers who had settled in the area were sent to speak with the Minister of Defense, Sir George Pierce. In order to solve this problem, the military were sent to the region with machine guns. Sir George Pierce was ex-military, and the soldiers, now farmers, they were farmers, veterans from the war, requested that the machine guns be sent to the area. Being ex-military, they were all aware of how effective machine guns would be. But things didn't go quite as well as what they thought they should go. On the 2nd of November, 1932, military traveled to Campion, where some 50 emus had been sent, or had been seen. The birds were out of range of the guns, so the locals attempted to herd the emus into an ambush. However, the birds split into small groups and ran so that they were difficult targets. The first series of shots fired was ineffective due to how far away the emus were. A second round of gunfire was able to kill a number of birds. Later the same day, a small flock was encountered and perhaps a dozen birds were killed. On November 4th of November, um, Major Meredith had prepared for an ambush near a local dam and over a thousand emus were spotted heading towards their position. This time, they waited until the birds were at point-blank range before opening fire. The gun jammed and only 12 birds were killed. The remaining emus scattered before the more could be killed. In the days that followed, Major Meredith chose to move further south where the birds were reported to be fairly tame. By the 8th of November, only six days into the war, 2,500 rounds of ammunition had been fired. Considering so many shots were fired, the emu casualties were not great. The number of birds killed is unclear. One account claims just 50. The others range from 200 to 500. Fortunately, the Major, Mer uh, Major Meredith, the military had not suffered any casualties at the hands of the emus. And the emus won that war. Now, going down this rabbit hole, I have found that uh, what happened was this. Emus, when they travel around, they have basically a head. They have a leader. And this was not known before this. This leader would literally put himself out there, and he would make sure that the rest of his group would run away. Now, these people would, uh, you know, these people were trying to kill these uh, emus, and the heads would like dart back and forth and become the targets, while the rest of them would sneak to the brush and get out of the way. The emus uh, were, in fact, smarter than the soldiers in this particular instance, and so without arm and without really having too big of brains, the emus outsmarted the Australian soldiers. It's kind of an embarrassing moment. In Australian history. Now, and I'm glad they pointed this out in the chat room, and I'm going to actually address this. Of note, and most people don't know this, Michigan and Ohio have not just been at odds with football. There was actually what they call the Michigan-Ohio War. What was it about? Well, Basically, it happened right where I'm broadcasting from Gadsden Studios in the southeastern region of Michigan. We fought over who got Ohio or got Toledo, Ohio. Toledo is right on a river. It's right on Lake Erie. It's a very important port, a very strategic place for commerce and everything. And um, apparently, Toledo, there was quite the skirmish. And there was pumpkin patch skirmishes, and there was a lot of vandalism and a lot of problems over Toledo, Ohio. The government had to step in and say, look, here's what's going to happen. We're going to give Michigan the Upper Peninsula, and in return, Ohio gets Toledo. I don't know about anybody else. I think that worked out really well for Michigan. I worked in Toledo for a year. I'll take the Upper Peninsula.
No, I kid you. Toledo is not a bad place. Yes, Jeep is still in Ohio, in Toledo, Ohio. The Jeep plant's there. It's just been refurbished. The roads going in and out of there have just been repaved. I, I, I can tell you this. Toledo's an industrious town. It's only a half hour from where I'm broadcasting right now. I like going there. I've been cruising the streets of Toledo since I was 18 years old. A lot of cool stuff going on there. I'll make fun of it because I just am who I am. But it's a great city. I'm just glad it belongs to Ohio and not Michigan. Right now, I'm really glad because I can drive a half hour and get a haircut now if I really want to. Can't get one in Michigan. Nope. Get a ticket. Oh, man. We're already coming up on 1025. Let's talk about something really weird for a minute. I'm going to talk about a lot of weird stuff today. There's a lot of um, species of animals that don't actually belong in the United States. We have uh, carp that are going up the river trying to get into Lake Michigan uh, in Chicago right now that don't belong there. And they are trying like crazy to keep them out of Lake Michigan. They're not doing so well. Um, there's a lot of, of invasive species. Um, kudzu, a lot of people don't know it, but if you're in the South, you see kudzu. It's not a natural uh, plant that grows down there. It's an invasive one. It was brought over from somewhere else. Well, just when you thought that things couldn't get any worse about invasive species, Georgia comes out with a warning of a four-foot-long lizard that eats anything it wants. Do you think murder hornets are bad? These things are out there. Georgia's on the lookout for another invasive and more than a little creepy critter. And this is according to Alita Gore of, uh, what's she, Al.com. Hey, I like that, Al.com. That's a great name. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources is warning that an invasive species of giant lizards known as Argentine black and white tegus has established itself in the state. Tegus, which can grow up to four feet long with a weight of 10 pounds or more, eats bird eggs, other reptile fruits, vegetables, plants, pet food, and live animals from grasshoppers to young gopher tortoises. They eat about anything they want. One of their favorite foods is eggs from ground-nesting animals, such as the gopher tortoise, which is a protected state reptile in Georgia. Uh, they eat uh, bird eggs, including turkey and quail. So this thing can get really bad. This is a native to South America. Uh, tegus or tegus are black to dark gray with speckled bands across their backs and tails and can live as long as 20 years. And according to officials, are very strong swimmers capable of staying underwater for a long time. They don't have very many predators here, and they can multiply quickly. A female can lay 35 eggs. That's kind of creepy. These things can grow up to four feet long. If you're living in Georgia, uh, be on the lookout. I think that would just be yet another reason to carry a sidearm if I was living in Georgia. Wow. And taking a look at these things, they look kind of like a, a miniature uh, Qu uh, Komodo dragon. They're, uh, they're creepy. They're creepy. I'm safe because it'll only last a little ways up here. And once it hits November and the temperature drops out, they'll be gone. I'm Alan Ray. This is a refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I do this for free on klrnradio.net in the chat. I hope you're there. Um, it is a political free Friday night. You just heard in the crease with Jeff from Stoner Brewing. You're going to hear juxtaposition after I get done bloviating for the next half hour. We're at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to take a little break. When we come back, I got a lot more strange, bizarre news you need to hear. Don't go away. The Nerd Fest continues. I'll be back in just a moment. Listen now and don't forget if you go for that solid jive, you can always keep the dream alive. Palin, palin, palin with that. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. 
Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. I am Alan Ray, your humble host. Do I laugh too much? Well, there may be a, a problem with that. I might. Who knows? You never know. Nitrous oxide is just one of the many air pollutants. That is a detrimental effect on our climate, according to researchers. Um, but for researchers studying penguins, king penguins in Antarctica, there had been an unexpected effect of their cognitive state. You see, a recent study published in the Journal of Science of the Total Environment reports how Professor Bo Elberling and his team from University of Copenhagen's Department of Geosciences and Natural Resource Management uh, kind of went cuckoo while working surrounded by penguin poop. The problem with penguin guano, penguin poop, it produces a significantly high level of nitrous oxide around their colonies. So after nosing around in the guano for several hours, you tend to go a little sideways. You tend to start laughing. One begins to feel ill and get a headache. Besides being a strain on the climate, from what they're saying, nitrous oxide is also a sedative gas used in dentist's office, which we know. And the side effect of the sedative, also known as laughing gas, includes feelings of euphoria, relaxation, calmness, and fits of giggles, as well as confusion, headaches, and nausea. 
Dental and medical procedures have granted YouTube with a rich library of entertaining videos showing how nitrous oxide can make people behave. But the scientists were working with these uh, these king penguins in the Antarctica. And uh, after being around the defecating penguins, the nitrogen released from the penguin guano into the ground where soil bacteria converts it into greenhouse gas nitrous oxide resulted in a gaggle of giggly Antarctic researchers attempting to practice science. I don't know if there's actually videos of this, but I would like to see that. So yet another reason to get penguins is because you'll feel better. You get laughing gas for free. Uh, this team was exposed to the laughing gas laced guano while studying the impact of the penguins' nitrogen output and glacial melting on levels of air pollutant in South Georgia. While nitrous oxide emission is, in this case, are not enough to impact Earth's overall energy budget, our findings can contribute to the new knowledge about how penguin colonies affect the environment around them, which is Interesting because colonies are generally more and more widespread these days. So there you have it. Um, another reason to study penguins. Penguins are our friends. Natural producers of nitrogen oxide. Who would have thunk it? You got to love penguins. You just have to. This show has everything. We have everything. We, we have the war of the emus. We have penguins. We have four-foot giant lizards. And now... We have microwave beam shooting Air Force space planes. Would I lie to you? No. LiveScience.com says a secret military plane will soon test the idea of using microwave beams to send po solar power to Earth from space. The U.S. Air Force's X-37B, which is a plane that's just shrouded in mystery. I've kind of kept my thumb on the X-37B. Uh it, it, they're not letting a lot of, out with it. But anyways, it's ex expected to launch into orbit Saturday, May 16th, which is tomorrow. With an experiment on board that tests the possibility, uh, the photovoltaic radio frequency antenna module flight experiment, which we will call Pram FX from now on because, wow, that was just a lot of syllables I spewed out at you. Uh, it represents the first orbital test of such a sci-fi technology since the 19th century. What this thing does, if I've got this uh, contact right, is they're going to send this, the X-37B, into space. It is going to beam down microwave technology to something on Earth to solar power it through a more concentrated beam instead of just exposing some big panel to, uh, to the sunlight. Now, the idea gets a lot of attention, and it came into its own like in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, where it became, you know, they were really exploring a lot of energy sources other than fossil fuels. So they came across this microwave to solar energy, and it could be very useful. What they're going to use it for now um, is basically trying to power um, some of the probes and some of the uh, some of the things that they use drones that they're you know over battlefields and stuff like that. If they can sit up in space and shoot microwave beams down to these drones over a battlefield. Those drones can be powered indefinitely. They never have to land. They can just fly over that thing indefinitely. Now, in the future, this could come down to uh, us getting in maybe an electric car, electric vehicle of some sort, and through the technology of GPS or something like that, um, these microwave beams can be shot down into our car, and um, we'll have popcorn in our car. No, they'll uh, they'll charge they'll charge batteries while we're on the go while we're on the move and I don't I can't see this happening without some sort of thing to charge you but you know by the hour of of electricity because that's just not the way things work but anyways um, what they're going to do is they'll shoot these microwave beams down onto solar panels on the on the tops of cars which they are just before I even came on I, I happened to stumble across a uh, article about how they are using solar panels on roofs of cars. These are nothing new, but they're actually found a way that will help them keep batteries powered. But if they can project these microwaves down onto them, your car will be 
basically recharged almost, you know, in, a, in an hour or two where it takes quite a bit more to do that now. I still think you'll be able to pop popcorn in them, but, I, you know, that's just me talking. That's what I would rather have. You know, I'll fill it up with gas. I really don't care. What I want to be able to do is go down the road and pop popcorn. That's just me. That's how I am. <sighs> what else do we have here? Oh, yeah, the earth is really freaking out right now. And not only do we have problems on the surface of the earth, and I don't really want to go into that because it's all you get on the news. You know, I try to do this show. And I don't want to talk about what's going on outside your front door right now. We all know it's on the news 24 seven. It's on the radio. It's on the newspapers. It's, it's, they're just taking a hammer and pounding it into your face. What I want to talk about is things you don't know that are going on around the earth right now. Uh, the first one, and this is, uh, my good friend, Ordy Packard, who is in the chat room right now, kind of turned me onto this and I sunk down this rabbit hole and it went on to another couple of rabbit holes. We have spoke a couple of different times on solar minimums, solar maximums, what the sun is doing out in space, how we have sent um, probes out into space to position themselves at different places in the sun so we can catch things like mass corona ejections coming towards Earth or something like that. Well, the Daily UK has um, come out, and there's I've seen a few articles on this. The sun has now gone down into lockdown. The big news this week about the giant burning, boiling, spinning thermonuclear reactor, which lies 93 million miles away from Earth, but is our primary source of life-giving heat and light, is that it's gone into lockdown. Forecasts of a lovely, long, blue-skied barbecue summer to perk up our enforcement uh, staycations, perhaps, mm, it might be pretty good news. At the very least, a spot of predictable, settled weather to keep our battered spirits afloat, sadly not. It turns out that the sun has gone into a lockdown recession, or more accurately, a deep period of solar minimum, which is not good, especially not good for radio waves and getting you know your favorite radio station tuned in. It means that the activities on the sun's surface have fallen dramatically, and the magnetic field has become weaker, letting into the environment more of the sort of cosmic rays that cause dramatic lightning storms and interfere with astronauts and space hardware. It can also lead to the explosions of sprites, which are clusters of orange and red lights that shoot out of the top of thunderstorms like 60-mile 60 uh, 60 high palm trees into the sky, which are cool. And yes, on top of all that, theoretically, it could cause the temperature on Earth to drop to potentially catastrophic new lows. Now, where have I heard this before? Oh, that's right. When I was a kid in the 70s, Leonard Nimoy did an entire uh, hour special on how I'm supposed to be broadcasting right now from two miles under the ice. I'm not. Anyways, um, while the Met Office and members of the Royal Astronomical Society are urging us not to panic and reminding us that this is just nature there's nothing to worry about um there could be some doom and gloom and carrying on looking at some of these articles you know we could have another blizzard of 78 if you're too young to remember or if you're not from this area the blizzard of 78 buried buried michigan ohio indiana illinois wisconsin right across that strip in just feet of snow and not only did it do that but immediately afterwards, the temperature dropped out to sub-zero, and it stayed that way for a couple of weeks. It was a really crazy time. A lot of people died in that uh, snowstorm. Now, we have better ways of telling the weather now, so we can predict that kind of thing. And looking back up to the blizzard of 78, we know that it was three distinct fronts that met right over this area and stalled and just dump tons of snow on everybody. We know that now. So we can predict that. We are a lot more accurate than we were in the 70s. So the sun has gone into a solar minimum, and we don't know if it's going to come back out anytime soon. Now, you heard this here about four weeks ago, six weeks ago, one of these, that we were talking about this. Now they're talking about that this thing could create tornadoes, thunderstorms, uh, blizzards, all kinds of inclement weather that we just are, are just freaking out. Fire about. and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Now, if that's not enough for you, here's something else. There's proof now. There's proof now 
that the core of the earth spins. It's rotating. There's more than a little proof. Now, geologists have been, and this, what is this from? This is from uh, ZMEScience.com. Geologists have been debating for decades whether the planet's inner core is rotating or not. Now, new evidence obtained by the Chinese researchers seem to hint towards that it is, according to seismic data. The motion of molten iron alloys in the Earth's outer core acts as a planetary dynamo, generating a massive magnetic field called the magnetosphere. It extends for several tens of thousands of kilometers into space. And here we are. Nerdfest alert. Yep, this is a nerd alert. It's going to last for a while, too. Anyways, um, there's a lot we don't know about what's going on inside the planet. We can't get down there enough to really study it. The planet's core, we don't know what it does, but um, there's a complex physics to generate magnetics field. For instance, the North and South Poles, and we're going to get more into this, have wandered. And over time, they flipped periodically. For decades, the motion of the inner core has been a realm of theoreticians. But in 1996, Zayadong Song, now a geology professor at Peking University in China, detected seismic waves passing through the inner core that suggested differential rotation of inner core relative to Earth's surface. So basically what they're saying is, uh, importantly, we're seeing that these refracted waves change before the reflected waves bounce off the inner core boundary, implying that the changes are coming from inside the inner core, Song said. This work confirms that the temporal changes come mostly, if not all, from the body of the inner core. And the idea that the inner core surfaces changes are sole sources of the signal change can now be ruled out. So what's going on there is that the center of the earth is rotating just like we're rotating. Everything's moving under your feet. If you live in California, it's more so than usual because this morning they had quite the fun. Um, nice big earthquake out there. It, it reached a pretty good magnitude, felt all over the place. Uh, our own Ordy Packard, who's coming up on juxtaposition, was woke up from it because he was in chat this morning on uh, Rick and Stacy's show, uh, The Daily Dose. And, um, yeah, this may be why things are uh, rotating under your feet. Now, here is something. While we're on the subject of the Earth, and while we're on the subject of the Earth's magnetic field, now, we have taken for granted for years that the North Pole and the South Pole are magnetic solids that, you know, you get a compass and it points to true north. The problem is true north is moving. Our planet wears its magnetic field like an oversized coat, one that just doesn't fit comfortably. And all that sliding means the North magnetic pole is destined to move closer to Siberia's coastline over the next coming decade. There's no conspiracy behind this. Geological forces responsible for this have been something of a mystery, but now we might be a little closer to understanding what's going on. Researchers from University of Leeds in the UK and the Technical University of Denmark have analyzed 20 years of satellite data, finding that the monolithic competition between the two lobes of different, or differing magnetic force near the core is likely to be behind this wanderlust. The magnetic field moves nine miles a year and has been for quite some time. When the precision of the position of the Earth's magnetic north was located for the first time back in 1831, it was squarely in Canada's corner of the Arctic on the Boothia Peninsula in the Northwest Territory or in the territory of Nunavut. Ever since, fresh sense of measurements have recorded this spot drift north by an average of around 15 kilometers, which is nine miles, like I told you, every year. Advanced technology means we can now keep a careful watch on the pole's locations with unprecedented accuracy. Prior to the 70s, the North Magnetic Pole's position was kind of like a drunken stagger. Since then, it's had a mission marching in a straight line and building speed. Now, should we be worried about that? I don't know. Should we? Uh, on its current trajectory, we can expect it to be anywhere between 390 um and 660 kilometers, which is 240 and 410 miles, further along its journey in 10 years, bringing it within a whisker of the northern limits of the East Siberian Sea. Now, 
what we got to think about here, and this is what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. You don't think about things like this, but it matters. You see, we have um, satellites flying around in space. We have ships sailing around on oceans. We have submarines. We have all kinds of different things that rely on GPS. GPS relies on knowing exactly uh, where the North Pole, the South Pole is, and it keeps changing. So we have to keep track of what's going on. Um, Earth scientists Philip Livermore and Matthew Bailiff from the University of Leeds in UK and Christopher Finley from the Technical University of Denmark reviewed the 20 years uh, data from the ESA Swarm mission. The pole's heading lines up neatly with two anomalies called negative magnetic fluxes, one deep beneath Canada and the other below Siberia. Now, the importance of these two patches in determining the structure of the field close to the North Magnetic, magnetic Pole has been well known for several centuries. So they've known about these lobes. Um, so that's what's going on in the Earth around you. Our literally true North Magnetic Pole is moving. Now, there's a lot of speculation. Will it flip? Will we reverse polarity? And what will it do if we reverse polarity? I mean, we've got all of these gizmos and gadgets and cell phones and computers, and a lot of it relies on geosynchronous orbit, and a lot of it relies on knowing where you're at. A lot of it relies on computers that rely on knowing satellites, knowing where true north is. If all of a sudden the magnetic field flips, What's going to happen? Something to think about, right? Well, I'll be lost because nobody knows how to tell uh, where they're going anymore without a phone in their hand. I, I, you know, number one, I've said this on here a lot of, uh, a lot of times that we really, we haven't made this day and age. You know, as a musician growing up, we would have, uh, scant directions. They would say, yeah, you just go here, be here by eight o'clock, set up, play. And we would get really bad directions. Nowadays, we depend on these cell phones and they're great. The technology is awesome. All you have to do is ask whoever hires you, say, hey, what's your address? Boom, you can find it in a few seconds and your phone will lead you right there. It's fairly incredible if you think about it. So, you know, um, there's a lot of things, gyroscopes and ships, Things like that. Yep. And, and, and already even says that um, gyroscopes and birds will fail, leading to a huge battery drain. We'll have to do this quarantine all over again. Hate when that happens. Oh, so what do you do? Um, I'll end the show on a positive note. Debris from an 18 ton Chinese rocket may have crashed to earth and landed in Africa from newsweek.com. Fragments of a large Chinese rocket segment that plummeted to Earth in an uncontrolled descent earlier this week, which means something screwed up. Shh, don't say that out loud. Uh, may have fallen in, on land in the Ivory Coast. Initial data indicates that the 18-ton, nearly 100-foot-long core stage of the Long March uh, 5B rocket, one of the largest pieces of space debris to have ever fallen to Earth in an uncontrolled fashion, had smashed harmlessly into the Atlantic coast or Atlantic Ocean off the coast of uh, Mauritania in West Africa on Monday. However, locals in the village of Mahonua, which I think I'm saying that right. Mahunawa? Wow, I can't say that. That's words too complicated for me. In the Ivory Coast, have found what appears to be a long metal pipe that reportedly fell from the sky. According to Jonathan McDowell, an astrom astronomer from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics who tracks space objects falling to Earth, Mahonawa is directly below the projected path of the Long March 5B core stage around 1,300 miles downrange from where the rocket piece reentered the atmosphere. So there's a really good chance that, yes, those villagers found a, uh, well, there's reports of a 39-foot-long object crashing into the village, and it's probably that rocket. So your odds of being hit by a rocket have just increased ever so slightly. Ah, what an episode. We're already almost to the top of the hour. You know, it's always my goal 
that when you listen to, uh, I do this for free, that you walk away with it laughing a little bit. And you also walk away with it, knowing something that you didn't know before. We went over wars that made no sense that nobody knew about. We went over degrees falling from the sky and the earth changing from underneath your feet. You know, I'm looking at all this stuff. And like I said, I kind of went down a couple of different rabbit holes this week, looking at the, the magnetic um, poles moving, looking at the sun pretty much going into a, a solar minimum, which is weather wise can be very dangerous. Um, I just get the eerie feeling that we are going to start experiencing weather patterns much like we did in the uh, 60s to mid to late 70s, which really, and, and I lived through quite a bit of it, a lot of tornadoes, a lot of heavy blizzards, um, a lot of very inclement weather. So we're going to have to start focusing ourselves on being safe again. And wouldn't it figure, you know, we've got this virus that I'm not going to talk about. We have murder hornets. We have four foot long lizards that eat anything they want. Now we're going to have to start worrying about the weather. I think the planet's ganging up on us. I just get that airy feeling. Uh, now we're going to have robots. Yep. It's going to be killer robots uh, entering the earth pretty soon here. And, and uh, Oh yeah. T- that's the other thing too. We have UFOs. The government has come out and has told us that there's UFOs. They don't know if they're little green men from Mars. They don't know if they're uh, just something that occurs naturally, but there's something out there. What a weird year 2020 is becoming. I don't know if I enjoy it very much, but we're going to get, yeah, it's exactly right. Jeff just put out, (laughs) Jeff just put out a uh, a meme in the chat room. So rule number one, never set the time machine to 2020. That's what they're going to say, you know, a thousand years from now. Oh, we got these time machines. Whatever you do, don't go back to 2020. It's just not a good year. Murder hornets, viruses, you got earthquakes. You got magnetic poles moving, solar minimums, four foot long lizards. You got uh, nitrous oxide pooping penguins. What else are you going to get this year? Oh, my gosh. We're winding this show down. I'm Alan Ray. This is the refreshingly non-political podcast about everything else. You got juxtaposition coming up next, and I've been kind of scanning the chat a little bit while I'm talking. It looks like they're going to have a really good one. One of my favorite subjects, JFK. Uh, we hope you're really enjoying KLRN Radio. There's so much stuff on here, so much good content. You got, I mean, if there's something, if there's something you like, stick with it, investigate and explore all of the great programs we got going on. And it just seems like we're lining up more and more throughout the day. I mean, we're starting the morning with Rick and Stacy on, uh, on the daily dose. That is a great show. Uh, it's in fact, Really, when you get up, I I catch usually the first hour of it before I get to work. And then, you know, it's really hard to focus on it because I walk in the door lately and all heck's breaking loose and, you know, things are going crazy. But hopefully I'm going to get back to my my original schedule where I can get up in the morning and drink my coffee at ease and, and do my own thing for the first few hours. Oh, we can only hope so. I miss my afternoon shift. However, that being said... Stay tuned for Juxtaposition coming up next. I'm glad you guys tuned in to I Do This For Free. I am Alan Ray. Man, I tell you what, I can't wait to do another episode of this. Next Friday, yes, I will be doing a Hardcore Patriot. Hopefully, I'll just keep doing uh, back and forth between Hardcore Patriot and I Do This For Free. And there may be another show for me coming up pretty soon. We'll discuss it. Until we meet again, we'll talk again soon.